Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Bea de los Arcos and I'm from the Open University in the UK. And um, um, would you go to the next one? So this is, this is where, I work, where I work, is the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. So um, the Open University is the, it, we, we are a distance education university and um, we are the biggest educational institution, academic institution in the, in the UK. We have 200,000 200, students. And in a way, we've been flipping from the very beginning. We started in 1969. In a way, we, we already were flipping, but you know, without really calling it the, the, the flip. Um, because the way it works, our students, uh, when they register, they get their they get a set of materials and ideas that they work, they work at their own pace uh, themselves. Yes, there is an exam at the end of the year. Yes, there are certain assignments that they have to that they have to submit. But um, basically, what they're doing is they work at their own pace. And then there's tutorial time where they meet um, they meet with other students and they meet with with a tutor. And that's the time when they they come they come to do the hands-on work, for instance. So. I, um, so I'm a researcher at the Open University, but I, I, it's probably 5% of my workload is still teaching. I, I was a teacher before being a researcher, and uh, um, I teach Spanish. So I've been teaching Spanish for, for a long, long time. I'm, I'm Spanish myself, so it's actually very easy. Um, so the way, would you just go for the next one, please? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the way it was about, <laughs> I was, well, I know you're okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when uh, it was when I was working at the Department of Languages uh, that we came up with this idea, or my colleagues came up with this idea. See, how do we get? See, if I teach Spanish. Right, and I'm creating my materials for my Spanish class. Um, did I want to have a place where I could actually share those materials with, with somebody? Right, so you know, up to that point, if somebody, so if I had this, this wonderful resource that I was using in my class that was, that was working really well, the way I could share it with somebody was if I physically saw somebody and I said, you know, I have this resource, would you like to use it, right? But in the case, you see, we're a distance university, so the chances of me seeing in person another, another tutor were pretty slim, right? So the idea was, okay, what happens also, what happens if we put all the materials that we create, we put them online for everyone to see, okay? So it's not for you, you're just going to put up whatever you, you feel comfor comfortable putting up. So it's, it's, the idea was also that, you know, it's not only sharing what, what you're doing, but also being able to have a look at what all the teachers are doing. So, you know, I teach Spanish, but maybe if, I mean, a lot of the time when we go to, the, to look for resources on the internet, we're looking for ideas, we're looking for inspiration. So you could have a look at what the German tutor was doing in this, in this German class, or the Chinese tutor was doing in her class, and then bring those ideas to your class. So it was kind of a win-win situation, really. So that's how the repository started. It's the languages, open resources online. So it's just a place where everybody could actually put in the resources that they wanted, right? But then, you see, we had another little problem. And it's that at the time, I mean, I'm talking about 2009 when we were doing this. At the time, um, because we're a distance, um, a distance university, a lot of the tutorial time is not always face to face because our students come from all over the country. So it's not always easy to have them all physically in the one spot. So we do a lot of tutorials online. We, at the time we used to, we were using a, a, an audiographic conferencing system that was created in-house in the Open University. So the screens that we used, the materials that we used online were very specific to that system. So if you really didn't have the system, you couldn't really access the material. So, you know, there's no point in sharing something that you can't use because, you know, you don't have the system. So that's how we started thinking, actually, we need to change the format. So you share something, but at the same time, 
what you're going to do is say, right, but I want somebody else to be able to, to use it. So all the screens that we had, we basically translated into Word documents, translated them into all the formats like PowerPoint presentations, for instance, so that all the people could actually access that kind of material. And that was, that's okay, come in, come in, you just missed the beginning of the story, but anyway. Well, so that was how all of a sudden, right, I could see myself as an open educator. Nobody had said to me before, do you know what, you are an open educator. But going through this process of sharing what I had created, using what other teachers had created, and then you know, changing the format, so making it easy for other people to use, that's how, without really realizing it, I became an open educator, right? So. You talk about open. What does open mean, really? So you're going to see, like the open movement, it means different things for, 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 for different people. Some of these sentences probably you're familiar with, whether it's open textbooks, open licensing, you know, open access, open source. Um, but there is one thing, see, there is one thing that we agree on, and that is that um, being open means having the freedom to share, having the freedom to remix, having the freedom to redistribute what, what you're doing. Yeah? So, here again, borrowing the words of the great Tina Turner, <laughs> hit the button, hit it. <laughs> You say to yourselves, actually, when I'm a flipped educator, what's the open going to do with it? <laughs> right? Okay. Okay, so this is where the other story begins. So hit the button again, please. This is us. We are, I said to you, I'm a researcher. I mean, once a teacher, you're always a teacher. But unfortunately, you know, I teach very little. Most of my time is spent with the OER research hub. Uh, project and we are project. It's uh, we're funded by the Hewlett Foundation here in the states. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to look into the impact of open educational resources. Right? We're trying to understand the impact of open educational resources. Hit the button, please. So our starting point. Don't worry about this. All my slides. The slides are already on SlideShare. <coughs> I've tweeted them, I can tweet them again, so you can, don't worry about taking out time or anything if you, do, if you don't want to, because there's no need. So this is kind of the starting point. We, we started uh, with a set of hypotheses. So we think, okay, uh, for instance, when we use all our resources, open educational resources, OER, uh, what's the impact on, on the students? Do, do, does it increase student satisfaction? Does it inc increase student performance? Right? So that was the, all this starting point. We have a set of hypotheses that we need to investigate. We need to, we're looking for the evidence to say, is this true or is this not true? And what we're doing is we're collecting all that evidence that we that we find, and we're sharing it with everyone using the OER impact map. So again, this presentation is not about the OER impact map, okay? but at the same time, I mean, I invite you to go and check it out whenever you, you get a chance, because uh, um, it will tell you against all those hypotheses, where is the evidence that we have found, so what's working, what's not working, where is the evidence, and like with really, where, see where is the evidence situated, so we have nice diagrams as well to show basically what, what it is that, that we're finding. Um, and we've been very, very lucky really, because in order to try and look for all this evidence, what we've been doing is, We've been collaborating with a lot of projects across the world, really. Uh, most of them here in the States, but also uh, South Africa, India. So it's been basically across the world, uh, different projects, some of them more to do with open education than others. And one of them, that's how the story started with us on Flip Learning, that we got in touch with Flip, Flip Learning Network. Because um, the idea for us was how how open are teachers when they flip the classroom, right? Okay, so that was the starting point. So, yes, please. 
So this is us. You might recognize Carrie. Uh, we had, uh, last year we had a, like a program of, of fellowships when we invited people to, uh, from each of the collaborations that we were working with, we invited them to come over to, to Milton Keynes, to the UK. Milton Keynes is where the Open University is based. It's not a really nice place, but that's where we are. So we invited, we invited, uh, we had this uh, program of, of fellowships and we invited, Carrie was one of the, the people who, who came and stayed with us for, for two weeks. And so we started working together. How can we actually figure out how open are um, flipped educators? And that's, you may have seen, it was like last year, I think last April, um, there was a survey that we ran through the, through the NIN community. And last year I spent time uh, talking to teachers and looking at teachers' blogs and, and all that. So, um, we get to the open bit. Um, I don't know whether you have had a chance to listen to John and Aaron talk about this particular bit. They, they talk, I, I was fortunate to see them uh, speak as, uh, in London at the BET conference, and it's a huge, massive conference, a huge, massive arena. And when John and Aaron were, were there, they were talking about flip learning as, um, you know, it, they, they say it really sits at the intersection between those three things, between relationships, content, and curiosity. So you can't have one without having the other. You can't have too much of one, but at the same time, you need to have that balance between, between the three of them. You can't spend, if you spend all your class with the kids just talking about content, you just bore them to death, probably. If you go and say, look, if you let them run loose and just learn whatever it is that they want to learn, you know, it's really not the right thing to do either. Okay, a bit of curiosity is fine, but you know, you have to guide them as well to um, towards a certain direction, you know, they, you know what really you need to cover in your program, for instance. So, and it's the same thing with relationship. Yes, it's good to have a good relationship with your, with your students, right? So, but the idea is that um, with flip learning, with good education, really sits at the intersection between the three of them. The three of them near each other, you can't have more of one than, than the other, right? Thank you. So, what I've been thinking is really what binds together the three ideas, right? Relationship, content, and curiosity. What really binds the three of them is the open aspect, is the open educational resource, right? So what I've been doing is I've been trying to figure out where is the openness in all your practices, what it is that you do as flipped educators, and uh, how does openness come into it to really enhance the flip that you're doing, right? So the next bits really are stories that, I, that I've gathered from different, from talking to different teachers like, like yourselves. How many of you, how many of you here, and we're not a huge group, how many of you here are teaching in K to 12? Okay, and you guys? University, University. okay. So uh, my main focus, uh, was initially K to 12, but I've got a couple of examples of higher ed as well, so, so it should be fine. So these are my stories, where I've tried to figure out, you know, how this relationship content and curiosity are basically enhanced when you're being open. So, would you, here's, so this is the first one, and I love this guy. This is a teacher in uh, Byron High, so it's a fella called Andy, and he teaches statistics. And uh, he's, he's put his, his, his course online, right? That's, that's the address if you want to check, up at some, check it up at some stage. Um, but what I love about this guy, right, is that um, he explains to his kids. It's, so this is kind of um, um, high school, right? The higher grades. And what he's saying to his kids is, do you know what? This is, he explains the difference between um, having copyright and not having copyright. So you know when you when you get a book and it's copyrighted, right? Um, there's nothing we can do with it. We can't change it. We can't customize it. You know we have to use it as as is because 
we don't own the copyright to change anything, right? But he's saying, and this is what I love, he's saying, uh, this course that he's created, right? He says, I do not treat this curriculum as mine. It belongs to the class and to the world, right? So one of the things that he's asking the kids to do um, as part of, of, of the assignments that they have to do is improve the course. So the course is, is there online for anyone, for anyone to, to, to use, to grab, to change, to customize. But he specifically talks to the kids and says, you know what, you need to change this and you need to make it better. Right? So that's part of your assignment. Go in and change it. Right? So see how the... So, okay, we've, on the one side we have kids creating the content. Right? Kids improving on the content. But see also how the relationship actually is leveled from... So you've got kids taking more control over their own learning. In order to actually change the, the course and improve it, they have the, they, they go through it, this, they think this, this doesn't work, this is badly explained, or they interview the other kids saying, you know, what, what it is that we can do, what is the evidence that this doesn't work. So it's like they go through that process of construction. So they, in a way, take ownership of, of their own learning. So the teacher, it's not really up here saying blah, 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 this is what you need to do. But it's come down to kind of the same level of the students when they are co-constructing co -constructing together, right? But it's this idea, this is the idea of that openness. It's like the class, or this curriculum, this stuff that we're using, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the class, it belongs to the world. And that's what the internet is giving you. It's a window, it's giving you a door to actually talk to the whole world. So, this is again another example. It's again, this is taken from uh, John's blog. And it's exactly the same situation, but see how it also works with small kids. So John here is talking about, he's saying, well, he's visiting a class, and when you have this idea of kids teaching kids. So, but again, it's the, the same idea. So the, the, these are 10 year olds and the teacher says to them, you know, you're gonna design, it's, it's all mathematics as well. Uh, so you're going to design a lesson that you could teach to the world. So we go exactly the same idea. Your class is not the four, was that your class has. And your class is now to the whole. You're making advantage or taking advantage of that of that window to the world. So the thing is that so they record their their, their little lessons, so explaining the kids explaining to all the kids how, how to do stuff. That is uploaded to YouTube, right? And see what John says. It has been motivating for these students to see how many people watch their videos. So the minute you put something online the minute you share something with the world, your conversation is not any longer just with the kids sitting beside you, the kids working in your, in your group, if, you, if you're working in small groups. It's not your class. It, that conversation you're having, you're having with the, with the whole world. Again, go into YouTube, check the, their, their videos because they're fantastic and leave a comment and they will love that. So it's the motivating aspect, aspect of actually sharing, sharing online, right? Uh, there was, I don't know if you took part in it, there was, there was a survey that the uh, uh, Flip Learning Network and Sophia ran together a couple of months ago when they asked, they asked you, uh, what, how do you measure the success of your flipped classroom, right? And 80% of you, said that it was to do with the student engagement and student motivation, right? So there you go, but being open, you're working, you're helping, you're just going through that student engagement, help the kids to get motivated to learn. Um, don't know if you're familiar with this, this is Math Train TV. It's exactly the same idea, we're taken to a much bigger scale, right? These guys are here, I only saw, I mean, I only took this, this screenshot like a couple of days ago, so the, 
they are here presenting and so on somewhere. So go on and, and see them if, if you want. It's the same idea. This is a teacher in, in California, and what he's <laughs> done is so he's make, making the most of this idea that uh, the kids we go through the effort to teach each other, to teach other kids, right? So what so what's that has been just a collection of uh, of uh, um, you know videos that's just been it's just it's just kept growing it's kids kids talking to all the kids kids teaching all the kids uh, so there's there's a legacy there for everyone to use they they've put all these videos in the one place right for everyone to access and then it's the, this idea again with sharing again we sharing with the world we don't really know who's using our videos but we give you permission and that's why they have a lovely CC by NC license so you can't make money but just go and use and use the videos and again it's the combination of, of getting the students own their own learning having the students the relationship with the teacher you know come down at the same at the same at the same level right okay let's talk about so this is all to do with creating content and sharing that content online let's talk about curiosity uh, this is a uh, program called vital science it's based up in Portland, Maine. And what they do is they, uh, it's for middle school children, uh, it's for teaching science initially, but you see how there's a lot of teachers uh, getting together, the math teacher, the science teacher, the geography teacher, getting together to work with, with vital science. The idea is the, uh, there is an expert scientist who posts a mission online, right? And um, um, this mission is to do with invasive species. They basically want us to, they, it's, they sat together, together at, at, a, at a round table. They got the scientists in the university, they got the teachers. Um, with one worry, how can we map how far have invasive species come into Maine? Right? So the idea is, okay, experts, scientists, what would you trust the kids to, what kind of information would you trust the kids to collect for you? Right? Teachers, what can you do with the kids in a 40 minute class? Right? So the, the, the way it works is the, the expert posts a mission online. So it's the, a mission is just a question. Can you find X creepy crawly? in your area, right? So the kids grab that mission, they go out, I mean it could be just their schoolyard, it could be further afield, but they just go and see what it is that they can find. So sometimes just go, be curious, what little creepy crawlies can you find in your schoolyard, right? The idea is that you take evidence, so you photograph or you, you take photos, you, you collect all your evidence, you put all that evidence online, and you say, we think we found X. I don't know. I don't really know much about creepy crawlies or insects and stuff like that. So uh, then the expert comes in and, and he says, yes, you found it, or no, you don't find it. So this taken to the level of curiosity with... Um, it happened like a couple of years ago that the kids just going out on their own business looking for whatever it is they were going to find, you know, they actually came across this. It was the first report of this very, you know, a, a bad, really, um, algae, you know. So it was the kids. It was the kids who found it. It was the kids that said, I think we... We think we found this, so put all the evidence online, and it was the experts coming to them. Remember when, again, John and Aaron talk about, you might have done it in your class, Genius Hour, when you just let them run loose, and uh, uh, John always tells the story of, uh, uh, he's, he's in a class, and he says, okay, what, what, what do you want to find out, kids? And they came up with this idea that, well, we want to know how the brain makes decisions. 
right? That was uh, that was what they wanted to find out. So they did all the research they could. They eventually, they ended up uh, skyping a, a professor of neurology in one of the big universities. I don't know where. And they asked him the question and says, you know, so how does the brain make decisions? And the expert said, we don't know. Right? In this case, we have, okay, it's a similar situation. Well, this is the case of the kids becoming curious. Um, the kids actually, I mean, they, this was just a, a, a wonderful experience for them. And then when they, it was the, the case that the experts came to them saying, yes, you found it. This is amazing. You know, you've, you've helped us so much. He did again. But see, the whole thing is that why? Because it's this idea that everything is posted back online. So you could go and access this information if, if you wanted. You know, so the expert can come in and say, gee, this is actually really good. And the evidence <laughs> is there. And what you're doing is, again, you're connecting, you know, you're connecting those who know with those who want to know and with other people that may or may not know. So again, you see how curiosity engenders all these, re these new relationships that, 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 you, that you're going to find. Yeah, here's again. So we're talking about relationships, right? This is, um, this is a teacher of English, right? Uh, and the whole idea is I was asking her, well, how has the flip changed the way you teach, right? And she was saying to me, and then I think it's a wonderful quote, is it, well, you know, I'm not so much the all-knowing odds behind the curtain that we grew up with. And it's true, isn't it? When, when I went to school, the teacher was the one who knew absolutely everything. You know, so the teacher was passing on that knowledge. This was you for, you had to take notes and then you gobbled it all up and then, you know, there was an exam and then you, you just pissed it back, you know. In this case, what she's saying, you know, it's like I am just, okay, I'm not exactly one of them because I'm still the teacher, but the way I can work with them, that relationship with them is like for them to understand that I, by no means, I'm the only that has this knowledge. I am I'm not the only one they can learn from, and I'm not the only one who knows the right answers. And how true is this, guys? I mean, you can, nowadays you can Google everything, and that's it. So that's basically, so that, that what she's saying is that's the way she's changed, the flip has changed the relationship with, with the kids in, with her kids in, in the class. Right? If you take again this relationship, hit it again. If you take this relationship to uh, the outside world again, right? This is Mrs. Bush, fifth grade, fifth grade class block, right? Uh, and uh, she's asking her kids to blog about you. It's, it's part of the math class, but it's also part of the English class. Do you, have you done that? Have you asked your kids to blog? No? That's fine. In this case, she says, yeah, she asks, and it's the same idea that I was telling you about when, when we had the YouTube, uh, the small kids doing the, the videos. It's like, the teacher said, the students love comments on their blogs, Please check them out. So again, you're inviting the whole world to come into, to come into your class, right? So here's it again. When I, I just went in and I hit one of them, and there's this little girl called Michelle, and she says, thank you for visiting my website. It is a pleasure to be sharing this information about me, right? So think about sharing this. OK, all these examples of in K-12. Uh, there was, um, I came across months ago while I was on, on Twitter, um, I came across this group of students doing CT231 in Ireland, right? And CT231 is just a module in second year in, in college in, in Ireland. And the module is to do with information, um, professional skills and information communication technology skills, right? And so, the lecturer has them to 
so they spend the first semester, they spend uh, time in class just doing whatever it is that they need to do, co cover the curriculum. The second semester, what they do is they need to work on a project that is going to be the final year project. Um, at the very beginning of the second semester, they need to present their ideas. They need to have a couple of slides and they do a presentation in class to their, to their colleagues on what it is that they, they, they want to do, right? Now, the lecturer, the teacher, encourages them to tweet during those presentations. Not tweet, no do you know, where are you going tonight? Are we going to the pub later? No, just tweet about what it is that we say, what they're, they're, they're seeing, right? So they tweet about each other's presentations and she encourages them also to publish those slides on SlideShare. She'll publish stuff either, if they have a blog, just publish, publish them in the blog and invite people to come in and comment. And that's how I came across their work, right? So just on Twitter, I just happened to come across it the hashtag, and I started being part of the conversation, you know, because I was amazed at the incredible stuff that second years in college were, were doing. They were coming up with some fantastic project. It was, you know, it was, some, it was so amazing that I felt I had to say something. So that's how I started engaging in Twitter with them, and that resulted in an invitation for me to go and visit their class and talk to them in person, you know. So there is so much that you can do when you, when you kind of open your class to the world, when, you, when, you, when you're open. So, here it again. <laughs> We're very small. What is that? This is a small group. I'm just going to pause for just two minutes. Uh, I don't know. Turn. I don't know whether you can. We can do this as as a group. Just so very few of us. But think about how much do you share? How much do you share? And how much do you use because it's by, it's been shared by somebody else? Think about it. I mean, I'm, I, it's 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 all about having this conversation with yourself. How much? Do you, do you create your own, your own, have you created your, I mean, as teachers, we always create stuff, right? What do you do with that stuff? Do you share it with somebody? You share it with each other, because you work together. Uh, so you share, this is a paper copy, or, okay. Do you share with other teachers? But if I came to you and I said, mm, can I have a look at your stuff? Uh -huh. You would give it to me, or you would, you would talk to me about it, right? Okay. Yeah, you give it to me. What about you guys? I, I'd say, because I'm in the arts side, huh? I'm so excited about all this, I have to keep saying, well, I'll bring it back to what I'm doing, you know? And um, I know if I go to a workshop and I'm inspired and I think that someone else can use that material, I make copies and I give it to them, or I, I you know, send it to them, yes. Oh, done that. Yeah. Yeah, we actually... I set up a shared Dropbox folder for my department, and I shared other things with their campus members. Yeah. Them, you know, most of it's just in my department. We don't really go. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, we we share quite a bit within my own department as well, and um, sometimes because there's four, almost five high schools in my district, so sometimes we'll just share amongst the schools, collaborate that way. But I also borrow a lot from what I find online. Exactly. Well, because. I ring that the mail. Somebody else has something really good to use. So I, I'm totally fine with borrowing. If somebody wants to borrow mine, great. Exactly. I think mine's as good. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you see, but then at the same time, you know, what you think is not, it may not be good enough. Somebody else might actually find it good. Yeah, yeah. You know, quality. Some somebody says to me, like, quality is in the eye of the beholder. Really, <laughs> you know. What about you? Do you share? In my previous school, we had a very large English department of about 30 teachers. Um, and so we used, I think it was Google Drive we used uh, to um, just basically put lessons up there, thought, um, resources, handouts, things like that. So we were kind of openly just throwing everything up there that we were dealing with sharing with the department. Yeah, see, it's, it's, I think it's part of our nature. I don't, there's, there's, there, I don't think there is one teacher in the world that doesn't share. Right? Okay, maybe there is, but, uh, but it's, you know, we, we are pretty much, you know, open in, in, in that sense. I mean, um, I'm a 
little hesitant to share videos because I've been to a workshop where the, the um, presenter took YouTube videos of teachers and pretty much trashed the teachers. And well, you know, not really, but, oh, look, they're doing this wrong, they're doing that wrong, they're doing, right? So if I, so it's, it's kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. You're right. There is, I mean, you, when it comes to sharing, you have to come to a point when uh, what it is that you're comfortable sharing with. You know, what, what, are, you, what are you comfortable sharing, really? Um, you're not going to be, you know, teachers, some teachers share absolutely everything. Other teachers just say, do you know what? Uh, I, I, I'm just going to share what I think is m my best stuff, right, and I put it there. Um, what you need to be sure is that, that you, you make sure that you share, if you want to share, what you own. And if you're putting, if you're sharing something that you don't own, then you should always get the permission of, of the person that, you know, in that case, you know, I wouldn't, if somebody the, I would have to sign some kind of informed consent if, if somebody's going to tape me, somebody's going to record me, and then criticize me and put all that online. You know, so it's 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 slightly, you know, it's it's not easy in the sense that, but you have to come to the conversations you need to have with yourselves. It's like how much do you want to do you want to share? Yeah. is that um, I have materials that I've presented and then they pop up, I see them, and the person has cannibalized my material, misunderstood it, and yet cited me, cited me, misspelled the name, you know, whatever. So I had to contact them and say, excuse me, can I talk you through my work? I think you've misinterpreted it. I mean, that was a big issue. It led me to trademark my work. I'm just, I'm just cautioning you what you throw out there keep tabs on what people are doing because if they can physically, you know, you can do anything now. They physically like recombine my ideas. They look different. That's one. The other is the problems I'm having with my administration because I have a colleague on another campus. I'm in a big university and we freely use each other's courses. She teaches it, then I teach it, and we add and we exchange each other's copies of the courses. They don't want us to do that. They want it to be her course, my course, they don't want us to copy each other's courses, and that's coming from the administration. Yeah. So there are these issues to be careful of, although I'm, I'm here, I'm totally in support of, of OER, but just remember there are issues. But you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The, the minute you share something, you lose control over that thing to, to some extent. I mean, there, there are ways, and that's, that's the next bit I wanted to talk to you about, is the Creative Commons licenses. So, hit, I'm not exactly sure which is my... Yeah, we, just very quickly, we asked you, um, the, the, the survey that we ran with the Flip Learning Network last year, we, one of the questions we asked was, like, how, what do you know about this logo, right? So, hit it three times, because it's, oh, oh no. Right, okay, so see what happened, we said um, then were the three options, so 33% said, mm, I've never seen it, right? Uh, I've seen it, but I don't know what it means, was 16%. 50% said, actually, yes, I've seen it and I know what it means, right? So you see, basically it's 50-50, who knows about Creative Commons, who doesn't know about Creative Commons licenses, right? So, okay, hit it again, please. Uh, so then we ask you how, how important it is open licensing. Open li licensing in the sense that understand by an open license that yes, you, you can you see, understand that not everything on the internet is ready for you free to grab. But it's, it's, when it has an open license, it's going to say to you, yes, you, you, can, you can use it, you can, uh, and you have freedom to, well, in certain cases, freedom to remix, freedom to tweak it, freedom to redistribute it again. Right? So we ask you about that. And, uh, okay, I still think that, it, like, 23% is quite a huge chunk that said, no, it's, it's not at all important, right? But overall, I think it's positive, because you have the red and the blue, you know, kind of really, again, like, roughly 50% will say, yeah, this is actually open license, important, not important. Here's it again. 
Stop there. So wait, just wait, wait. We asked, uh, okay, so how many of you guys create your own resources? We came up with a very high 95%, right? So yes, as teachers, I think we normally, we, we create a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> so we then asked, here this again, please. We then asked, okay, how many of you uh, create your resources and publish them online? So that came up with 44%. So again, so we have the situation. So it's, it, it's fine. You know, I'm going to share in person, but when it comes to sharing online, you know, I'm going to think twice about it. Then we asked, how many of you actually create your resources and publish them under a CC license? So publish them under a, an open license. And that came out to 5%, right? Uh, so that's one of the things that I, want to, that I want to change. The idea of, I'll give you one of this. What do you do with it? Grab one of this. This is one of the things that we like to do. I kind of, because when you talk about open licenses, right? And when you talk about flip learning, you talk about it being open, it's very much, um, it's like what happened to me in the beginning. You are open practitioners without really realizing that you're being open, right? The minute you share something, you're being open. The minute you go and look for stuff on the internet, you're being open, right? It's the only thing is that you don't tag your work yourself <laughs> as, as a, this is, you see, what I'm doing is, is, is open practice. And so that's why, that's why I call you, you know, flip, flip dedicators for me are the, the accidental open practitioners, right? Okay, so here's again, so that, this is one of the things that we created. Um, what I, because what I would like you to do, guys, and this is your homework, right, for next, for next year or for, for whenever. Um, think about when you look for stuff and when you create your stuff. It's like a Creative Commons license. What it's doing is um, the beauty of it is that you retain copyright over what you create, right? But a, like a CC license is just a way of telling other teachers um, how would you like your, your resources to be used, right? So yes, go ahead and use them <coughs> and uh, but, you know, tell them, you know, make sure that you, that you attribute them to me or just go ahead and use them, but, you know, I don't want you to sell anything that involves my work or I don't want you to change anything or I want you to change, to change everything, everything you, you want. So it's about, this is what I would like you, you see, I would like you to um, kind of be a bit more aware of your own openness, let's say, and also... See, when you're looking for resources, go looking for resources with a Creative Commons license. If you share your resources online, share them with a Creative Commons license. You might say, but it doesn't matter. Just put them in on YouTube and that's it. Actually, YouTube, you know, it's like help. You say, how do I know that I can use... See, I don't, I don't really have to be in Africa. I'm in the UK. I'm in London. I'm, and I'm looking, so I teach Spanish. I'm looking for, for a video that's going to help my, my, my students to see the difference between the past, different past tenses, right? Uh, I can't just go and grab anything because I, the likelihood is that I'm going to be infringing copyrights. You know, copyright, somebody's copyright. Right? So there are places where you can go. If you Google, you do like a Google Advanced, it Google, you know, you can actually search Creative Commons in, in Google. If you're looking for an image and you go to Flickr, Flickr Advanced Search will also give you the chance to, to actually look for, for only Creative Commons stuff. You know, but it's that idea of um, the, what I would like you to think about is that uh, okay, hit it again. There's, there's help, right? Okay, there's help in the sense that if you go to the Creative Commons um, website, um, they have like a step-step -step guide as you, uh, asking you kind of easy questions, like asking what do you want to do with your stuff? Do you want to uh, do you want other people to change to be able to change it? Yes, you know. So they guide you to different easy questions, uh, and at the, you know it comes at the end with with a 
like what's going to be your, 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 your license. You can then grab the code and put it, you can grab the icon and put it on your video, or you can just grab the code and put it on your web page if, if it is that's what you have. Here's it again, please. There's also a School of Open on P2P or the Organize. Uh, this is all free stuff. Right, it's just, it, it, there are different courses that you can that you can take. Some of them are fa they are facilitated at certain dates, but the materials are, are all there. Some of, so there is uh, copyright for educators, Creative Commons for K twelve educators. There's a lot of stuff. There's, there's a lot of support out there for you. Right, so again. So this is what I would like you to to do. Right, so this is for me. This is this is what's going to be your homework. The idea is that so. From my, like as a researcher, what I do is, is I look at the impact of OER use, right? And what I'm doing is, um, okay, I'm looking at OER, how do OER actually enable new ways of learning and new ways of teaching? And that's exactly what flipped learning is, right? Uh, okay, you can argue that we've been doing it for ages, but we never called it flipped learning, but it is kind of a new, a new trend, a new fashion, a new pedagogy, call it whatever you want, right? But the thing is that what the evidence that I'm finding is that, that whether you do it consciously or you do it unconsciously, when there's an element of openness in, in your own practice and it is towards that helping that student engagement in your class and that all these students um, demotivation. So, you know, that's what you want. You get your, you want your students motivated. You want your students engaged. You're doing that. You're achieving that through being, through being open, right? What I would like you to do is think a little bit more about what you do personally. As in, when you look for stuff, do you look for stuff with a Creative Commons license? When you share stuff, if at some point you're comfortable with sharing stuff online. Can you share it with an open license? What kind of open license do you want to share it? Do you want to share it with? Because I think, and I hope I'm not just going too far away, but I think as like as, as educators, especially everyone, but especially uh, K-12 teachers, right? We have a responsibility to talk to kids about openness. Right? Talk to kids about open licenses. The same way you talk to kids about staying safe online, we should talk to kids about, you know, when you're talking, you, come on, there's plagiarism. You're always saying to kids, on, hi, at least in the UK, it's a big thing. You know, they just go to Wikipedia, they just grab everything, oh, I did this. No, you know, it's the way that the, you, you educate kids to, to be digital citizens. Talking about openness and talking about open licenses has, has, has to be part of that. Because when you talk about this in class, that's the way these kids are going to grow up, thinking about sharing and thinking about, about uh, being open. And it takes only, it's just a little bit of curiosity. If you use an image in class and your image happens to have a Creative Commons license on it, right, explain that to the kids. Hey, kids, you know what? I grabbed it, this image, and you know what? I can change it or I cannot change it. But you know, include talk to your kids, talk to your students about 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 openness because that's you know that's the way, that's the responsibility for for the future. Of all the teachers that I that I that I've been talking to you about, uh, uh, the, it was Andy, the first one, the fellow with the statistics course, the, the the first one who talked to me, and I've talked to a lot of teachers. But he's the only one who talked to me. Um, Straight from the beginning, you know what? My statistics course is released under an open license. So, because he was the only one, I said, you know, where, how, why did you decide, you know, how did you hear about open licenses? How did it happen? And he said to me, well, actually, you know, we talked about it a lot in college. So, we were in college, you know, we were looking for images for our presentations or whatever. We were asked to just look specifically for Creative Commons stuff, right? So that's the proof. You, okay, it might not go in every single one of your students, but if it goes into one, and you as, as educators have that responsibility, 
you know, then it's all going to be fine. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk to you. There's more. I've got more infographics, so if, if anybody wants to take more, please feel free. Yes? So how does one decide? I see on your handout you have all these choices of the Creative Commons. There are about six or seven options. How do you decide which one to use? Do you use the Yes, the, I mean, the, 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 the combinations of licenses get a bit complicated, but it's, it just basically comes down to four. There's attribution, so if you, you know, somebody is, if, if you, um, if somebody uses your, your resource, they have to attribute it to you. There is non-commercial, so basically, yes, you can use it, but I don't want you to make any money, so it's, this is not for commercial purposes. There's no derivatives saying you can use it, but you can't change anything, right? So just use it as is. So that's, <coughs> that's probably kind of the most restrictive one. And there is a share alike, which is basically, you know, if you, yes, you can use it, you can change whatever, but then I want you to to share it and to share it under the same license that I published it in the first place. But um, so think about it. It's, it's stuff that you own, so the stuff that you have created yourself. If you're using somebody else's stuff and you incorporate that into your own materials, then you will have to seek clearance from, from, from them. So that's why it's so easy from the beginning just to look for stuff that is published under a CC license, right? Uh, but yes, definitely, if you go to creativecommons.org, it's very easy because it's a creativecommons.org, choose, and they'll ask you questions. So it's a very simple yes, no question. So would you like to would you like other people to make money after using your resource? Yes, no. So they'll bring you step by step and in the end they'll give you your, your, your license and also you know how the people have to attribute it. Okay. Yeah. And you can choose more than one icon. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good guys. So, do you know if we go, go for it? And there's a, there's a wonderful. I don't know if you, if you, there's a wonderful repository. I don't know if you're familiar with the CK12 Foundation. CK12 uh, have a repository. All their stuff is Creative Commons. Um, there's lot. Do you know about Merlot? Merlot.org, I think it is. Uh, Again, lots of free stuff. There's, there's lots of free in the sense that, you know, and uh, free to, to share, free to remix, free to redistribute. There's a lot of stuff out, out there. And this, like open educational resources are changing the lives of, of many, many, many people, right? So, I mean, if I planted, I mean, you're here obviously because you were a little bit curious about openness. So I hope that that see that it's already planted in your head that it actually grows and that you pass it on, pass it on. If you want to take more infographics, please do, because I have more if you wanted them. Okay, thank you very much.